So I'm going to be talking a bit about AI and machine learning and iOS in general. And I have pulled a little bit of a bait and switch in the sense that when I proposed this talk many months ago, I felt that Apple was not doing as much as they could to encourage machine learning on device. And so I was going to teach you to build neural networks and teach you to do all your own stuff. And then boom, WWDC and Core ML. So this talk has now um, been redirected a bit to give you an overview of how that works, an overview of machine learning, and just some thoughts on what I think this means and why I think it's so great. And I hope you guys think so too. So a bit more about that. What I was going to talk about and just things you want to keep in mind um, that explained why this was such a right moment for Core ML to come out, why this is such a right moment in mobile development. Um, one thing, Pythonic aspects of Swift. So I would argue that Python is sort of emerging as the leading data science, data analysis language. Many people would dispute this, but this, this is my personal opinion. Um, and so I have thought from the beginning of the introduction of Swift that there was so much in common, and that other than the strong typing versus non-strong typing, that these languages had so much in common that Swift was really perfect for machine learning applications and AI applications. Um, and so we do see some machine learning with Swift since Swift has been introduced, and people have taken advantage of sort of the functional structure of the language and, and cool things you can do, um, and even have been building neural networks for their apps, either in-app, training in-app, or migrating to app. Um, but it's been sort of this esoteric little corner of iOS development, I think. Um, and I think that's something that is going to change um, if not as of WWDC 2016, where there was a little bit introduced, then certainly as of WWDC 2017, and also certainly just because AI itself is becoming such a huge part of um, computing and the mobile space, and that's just going to keep going. So what I am going to talk about now is firstly Core ML and related developments at Apple. I'm also going to give you an overview of relevant machine learning concepts and just finish with some final bits and bobs, just things you should be aware of as you delve into this area. And for me, the goal is really empowerment. Um, as someone who works on the iOS side, I think we all have the experience that everything sort of trickles down to the device, right? We are the consumers of all sorts of services from other people, right? We are consumers of design groups work. We are consumers of business decisions. We are consumers and implementers of whatever was decided about the back end. And it all tends to come to us. And I think there is a danger that with Core ML and more AI moving on to the device, that could happen too. And one way that you can make sure that you feel empowered and involved in the process, rather than just someone who drags a machine learning model into your app, and maybe people are unhappy with you and it doesn't perform that well, but you don't really know how it works. I think it's much better to come at this from the angle of understanding how it works and feeling empowered. So even if you don't build the model, you know what the limitations are, you know how it works, and that can make you more confident as you migrate it onto an iOS device. So first, let's talk about core ML and related things. What did the world look like before WWDC 2016? Well, let's go back to 2015. Um, 2015, there was already a lot of AI, right? I think we, we all knew about Siri. We all saw really cool things on websites. Not so much on iOS, though, right? And so for the rare iOS engineer in 2014 or 2015 who was doing fairly hardcore machine learning, it could be a frustrating experience for a few reasons, right? Data science was already a hot thing. Um, but data scientists don't always know much about the implementation details of the techniques they use, right? So if you were one of these rare iOS engineers, you might have had the experience of working with someone with a stats background or an econ background or something like that who um, comes to you and they say, I have this linear regression. I want you to migrate it onto the device, or I have a decision tree. Um, it's going too slow when we go through the back end, so I really want you to code this up in Objective-C or Swift and, and go. But maybe... Um, if they were especially bad or poorly trained or maybe even just a little lazy, they sort of left you there. Um, and I heard stories like this of, of people who didn't have a stats background being asked to implement these sorts of things and not knowing how. So that's not so great. Um, we're glad it's not like that. Um, 
They also, they might know sort of that they use neural networks, but they don't know how to break their pieces up, right, into components. They might not even be aware there are components, right? There are certainly users of data science who, even though they should be more, like, stronger programmers, aren't, right? And there are lots of services that are designed to make machine learning easy, which is great, but then when you're the downstream engineer who nonetheless has to build something designed by somebody who doesn't entirely know how it works, it gets really tough. IOS engineers are IOS engineers, not data engineers, not data scientists. So um, it was much more likely even then that you would be asked to do something that really was not in your wheelhouse. But many interesting new applications are going to use some form of intelligence. This trend is only going to accelerate. I think Apple began to recognize this. And certainly, there were plenty of open source projects. So I just pasted a few of my favorite ones. People sort of got started on this on their own because there were these problems, right? Like, you have to build a neural network. Rather, whether Apple helps you, you're going to have to do it. So in WWDC 2016, a couple of things came out. Um, I don't know if they got as much attention as they ought to have, um, particularly given how popular and relevant neural networks were already becoming. But there was BNNS. Basic Neural Networks, um, introduced a set of routines for the Accelerate, that's the CPU framework, designed to implement neural networks, right? So that came out in iOS 10. It was somewhat limited, right? You could sort of build plain vanilla neural networks. And I will be talking more about how neural networks work. So I don't mean to be putting the cart before the horse. But you could only do sort of a subset of what people were already doing. There was also the metal equivalent that was implemented in the same iOS 10 rollout. You could also build neural networks. You had to build them layer by layer. So this was already different from how data scientists tend to do it most of the time. There are training frameworks, especially in Python, like Keras, that make it very easy to sort of build a whole neural network with a few lines of code, for better or worse, right? The things that make it easy also make it easy to use without fully understanding. Um, but in contrast, when you built it on iOS, you had to sort of build it one component at a time and sew them all together. So it was nice that Apple introduced these because these were really optimized for the device, right? You could go right to the GPU, which can otherwise be a nightmare. Um, but it was still a lot more work than your data scientists were doing, right? Which still means in 2016 when you do this, your data scientists are still a little confused about why it's so hard for you to implement their model, right? They think they've done all the hard work sort of doing the training and the thinking and the error catching. And they're sort of like, well, what's taking you so long? Um, and I, I don't mean to be slamming data scientists and saying they're impatient, unfun people at all. But like, it can be hard to understand the other side of the equation, certainly. Um, and also, there was this general emphasis right, on AI, speech recognition, user intent, theory kit. All this great stuff came out. Um, in some ways, I would say it almost might as well not have uh, in the sense that I don't think this caught on super strong. And it just got so much more amazing in WWDC 2017, right? So 2016 didn't really fix the pre-2016 problems. You still had this whole thing of, if I don't know about this at all, I still have to sort of learn every single piece of a model. Um, 2017 sees the, core, the introduction of Core ML. It's almost like a set it and forget it style API, right? You really can use this for better or for worse without understanding. I think that's one of its greatest strengths as one of its greatest weaknesses, right? That's always the case. The easier it is to do some really amazing stuff that's like both great and really terrible. Um, it also doesn't cost you anything, right? So you get this ease without sacrificing performance. So everything that the Metal and Accelerate frameworks were already doing is still there under the hood. You just don't need to deal with those APIs anymore. Um, there were also some neural network related enhancements for Metal. So Metal got more kinds of kernels. It got an API for building graphs. That makes it much more like how data scientists build neural networks in the first place. You can also now serialize these things and save them on device. There's also many more data types. On the other hand, BNS did not get much updating. So that's also interesting to note. Um, that's partly because neural networks on CPUs, that's not really a thing most of the time. So that's something to keep in mind, too. So how does Core ML work? Let's actually talk about it instead of sort of the meta information. Um, Core ML in five minutes, for those of you who didn't catch the WWDC video, the first thing you need to know is with machine learning, what do you always have to do first? You always have to train, right? And even before you train, you think about how you're going to train, what kind of data you need, what your goal is. Is that a realistic goal? How are you going to do error checking? There's all these things. Um, but at the end of the day, it boils down to you have some data. 
And we say offline, mostly as an off-device, right? Um, if you can do this off-device with more computing power, that's certainly better. It will be faster. These can be very data-intensive endeavors. So you're not generally going to be doing this on-device. Um, so you get all your data. You put it through whatever your learning algorithm is. And at the end of it, when you decide that your model is good enough, then you call that your finished model. And depending on what kind of model you're building, a linear model, a neural network, et cetera, you can have one parameter, right? If you have a linear regression, you'll only have the two parameters, right? What is your slope of your line and sort of where is the intercept? On the other hand, if you have a neural network, you can have millions of parameters, right? Even after you have learned, right? So even your finished product can be enormous. That's something to keep in mind. Um, what Apple is really addressing now and what addressed in WWDC 2016 as well is the inference stage. So the inference stage is when you have a model and you're going to use new inputs, put them into that model and see sort of what prediction or what classification you would make for a given kind of data. So the example they used in their video was inputting pictures of flowers run that through your model, and you get both a label and sort of the probability that that's the correct classification out of the possible classifications. So you spit in this picture of a rose, and it pops out, rose, 95% confidence. Um, and by the way, I'd say with current state of the art, 95% is kind of on the low end. Um, with the state of the art neural network, you'd probably see more like 99.9% .9 certainty for something like this. Um, they have gotten to the point where they're actually better than people. Um, so you might have seen in the news lately things like neural networks do better than dermatologists, neural networks do better than flower experts, neural, ex neural networks do better than sort of normal people at recognizing normal street scenes. So it's getting quite scary. So that's, that's just an aside and something to get you interested. Um, so how exactly does this work mechanically, right? As, as iOS engineers, what are we going to do? Well, the first step is you need to get that stuff from your data science team into your model. Before, that would entail probably lengthy, lengthy meetings over many weeks trying to understand what they had done, what the parameters meant, which ones were most important, whether a numerical error was important, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if people are using one of these common frameworks like Keras or Cafe, there is an open source Python um, module that you can use to convert these to the ML model format. And the ML model format, by the way, is also open source. So you can write your own converters as well if you have the understanding to do that and the need to do that. Of course, you'd want to stick with the Apple models as much as possible. So this will give you an ML model file. The wonderful thing about ML model files is you just sort of drop it in your program. And that will get you a working model. So what does the Python look like? And for those of you who haven't seen Python and are wondering why I say it's so Swifty or why Swift is so Pythonic, you can see it up there, right? And I mean, I hope even just the shape of the language, the simplicity, the parsimony, it's exactly like Swift. It's just really beautiful. You can tell even just from reading it what's going on, right? So the Keras model is equal to some string, core model tools, dot converters, dot Keras, dot convert, pass it the Keras model, et cetera, and then model dot save, right? So very expressive, succinct, ways of saying things. Um, I would guess for most organizations you're working at, you want to get comfortable with this, because when we think about whose job this is going to become, it's going to be the iOS engineer's job, right? The data scientist is most likely not the one who's going to be exporting their model, because they're not the one consuming it, right? So if you are going to be consuming these models, you probably want to do the conversion so that you know what decisions were made, what might have gone wrong, right? If you just get a model from somebody, they won't tell you if maybe the converter through a warning, or there was something irregular, et cetera. OK. You get your ML model, however you got it. And that gets, um, gets to the point where it generates a Swift class just automatically. And you've got it as an executable in your app. What does that look like when you've dragged it into your app? Well, we can see here. Um, I apologize that the text is a bit fuzzy, but you can see things like the name of the model, the licensing of the model, a description of the input parameters, and output parameters. And if you click on the file name that it has generated automatically, you see nice Swift that has just been generated as an interface. The idea here is that you want to just deal with the model as another bit of code. It's almost as though somebody else had written that model in Swift for you, and you just need to look at the interface to know how to use it. So one way of thinking about this is that I've turned your data science colleagues 
into iOS engineering colleagues in a way, right? They, they, you just get their work product. You don't need to rebuild their work product, right? So that's great for a lot of reasons. When you don't have time to understand everything they have done and you want to make sure it's exactly replicated, this will do that automatically. Also, you won't have to spend a lot of time debugging, right? Um, there are actually tools in the Python converter to confirm once you have converted your model that it indeed is giving the exact same output with the same inputs. You can run thousands, if not millions, of test cases to absolutely be sure, even before you bring your model into the app, that it is giving the identical input, which means you won't have long meetings about why input doesn't exactly match and what might be going wrong there. So for those of you who have had this experience, all of that is at an end, which is really wonderful. The other thing that's really wonderful is this is how you do your predictions, right? It's just really fast. You instantiate your class, and you tell it, go predict. Here's your, here's your input. Boom, done, right? So something that could literally be many people doing it for a few weeks now becomes one person dropping it in and assuming you trust the input and the output. Boom, you're done. So that's core ML. It gets even better than that, though, because if we think about what are the most likely things you're going to want to be doing with your app? Like, what's hot now? What are the obvious targets? The two obvious targets, I think, for everyone are vision, right? Um, your phone has a camera. You take videos of most of the hot apps. You want to do something funny with videos, or you want to sort of understand what's going on in that video, um, and you want your computer to understand. So there's vision. Vision does a lot of things that were already done, but now it's been brought into one API, so that's handy, right? So you can do things like tracking objects, face recognition. Face recognition has just gotten a whole lot better than it has been in the past. You also have NLP, natural language processing. This is also an entire area of machine learning, right, that you can spend years doing a PhD on. And instead, now you can just use the Apple interface and get amazing results in many, many languages. Um, so common things you want to do, like identify a part of speech or know what language somebody is inputting uh, information in or understand what names they are using in their sentence or break text up into sentences or paragraphs, that will all happen through NLP. These two things are now on top of Core ML. What does that mean? That means you can use the Apple Vision and NLP APIs, or you can dig a little deeper and sort of do a mix of do-it-yourself and their APIs. So that's the Core ML in five minutes. There is a lot more to explore, and I notice that even in the subsequent betas that have been released over the last few weeks, there are new features getting added. So this is not a done deal, I think, for iOS 11. I think we can expect that Apple is really looking at feedback and is adding things. So a couple of cool features. Um, one, CoreML decides which part of a model to run on the CPU versus the GPU. So even the most conscientious iOS engineer does not need to run CPU versus GPU variants to see which is more performant. After WWDC 2016, right, when you had a GPU or a CPU option, but not a mixed option, if you wanted to be super conscientious or if performance was really important, you had to go through and execute on both. And you didn't have a way to 100% predict which would be more performant, CPU or GPU. You only had rules of thumb. Now, actually, Apple is just going to take care of it, right? It's just saying, trust us, we're giving you what's good for the hardware, boom. Um, as a rule of thumb, GPU does tend to be the best for many parallel identical operations, which tends to be what most machine learning models are. Um, but CPU can be good for memory intensive or computationally serialized processes. So that's good to know. But now that Apple is taking care of balancing out your performance for you, you don't need to know more than that. In general, GPU tends to be better. So that's probably what Apple is doing most of the time, too. Another cool feature is you can run it from the simulator. This was a big problem before. You want to do development um, for machine learning. You always, always, always had to put it on your device. Personally, I'm not really a big fan of that. I don't like to have to like, plug my computer in or my phone in, take it out, put it in, take it out. I don't even know what version of my beta I have on my phone anymore. It gets to be a big mess. So those days are mostly over, unlike metal. Also, so I was talking about how new things are still coming in, even since the announcement. One really cool thing was, um, I think it was in beta version, no, I'm not going to say, one of the subsequent beta versions, there's a possibility now to download and compile on the fly your machine learning models. That is really, really cool. Um, I would say it's amazing. Um, if your app is basically your model, right, certain apps really, it's like some machine learning model, some bit of intelligence, and that's your product that you're selling or giving away or whatever. But you find a bug, you have to do a whole app release, right? You no longer need to do that. So you can make your 
you can make your app more intelligent or fix bugs that are related to your AI interface on the fly. You just init your new model with a URL. So that's really cool as far as being able to do on-the-spot corrections or just evolution. What sorts of models do you get to use? Well, these are the currently supported models, and this is what I'm going to be talking about soon, just to give you an overview of what these are and why you might use them. Support vector machines, tree ensembles, linear regression and logistic regression, and then finally, the big one really is the neural networks. Those are just the monsters in the room that are, in my opinion and almost everyone's opinion, sort of going to eat everything up eventually when we have the computing power. So we'll talk about these a little bit more later. I just want to conclude some more thoughts on Core ML. Some downsides or opportunities to learn for you in your career. Uh, probably you need to learn some Python. We talked about this already. You probably want to be doing those model conversions, right? You want to have as much control over this new area in your app as possible. So for that reason, to get a little bit of Python in your brain if you don't have it will be really helpful as far as owning that entire AI pipeline in your app. It's very Swifty, or Swift is very Pythonic, so this should be a fairly easy transition. You will be responsible also for understanding what is going wrong in models on device, right? So now that it's going to be more on device, maybe in the past you consumed from a back-end API, um, that does mean more responsibility. That can be a downside, or it can be an opportunity to learn, right? Um, but it does mean that there will be a whole sort of new area of debugging. You'll need to understand the basics of the models just to start thinking about what could have gone wrong. Um, just from blogs and things, I have seen that these model conversions are not entirely perfect, right? We couldn't expect that they are. So the more you understand about how the model should work, the faster you'll be able to debug. I think this is going to emerge as a specialization for iOS engineers, right? You might become like the AI person on your team. Um, so that's something that's kind of interesting, right? Model translations. They are presented as very simple, but again, if you start looking at blogs of what people have been doing over the last few weeks, people are spotting some things that can get very complicated, uh, especially if you want to do pipelines of chaining models together. There's a lot of things that can go wrong, or at least there are a lot of opportunities to do things very right versus not so great. Model implementation also. So there are still opportunities to perform better than what Apple is going to give you. So what Apple has written is something that will make a generic model work well on their infrastructure, right? On the other hand, if you know something in particular about how your model works, you still have opportunities to beat Core ML. So that's something else to keep in mind as far as why people might want to specialize. You can definitely get some model performance enhancements and pitfalls that you can't do as Apple is doing when they're just writing Core ML for any kind of model. Um, it's not yet open source, so the downside there is also that it's always going to be lagging behind the most common and most powerful data science tools. Those are all open source, and they evolve very, very quickly. So for example, even in the rollout of Core ML, um, the Keras converter is a full version behind what's already sort of out there in standard. So that's already sort of an area where you're either going to have to do some work to write a new Keras converter, or you're going to have to work with your data science teams to sort of backpedal to the older version of Keras. So as always, when you're trying to mesh sort of open source with non-open source things, you're going to have these versioning problems. A couple of gotchas that have already emerged, too, things to keep in mind. Um, models can run fine on a simulator, which is wonderful, right? We don't want to be plugging our phones in all the time. Um, but then they can still sometimes crash on device. So there are still some ways that things are not seamless, and there's some speculation that this is probably because the simulator might just kick things to the CPU if they're going to crash on the GPU, but you don't get that same benefit when you run on device. So be aware of this also. It's still not good enough, as always, with iOS. It's never good enough to just run on the simulator. You can still run into problems. And then as far as bugs people have found, most of them so far it seems to be related to not using the right kind of input. So there are many ways, for example, to describe an image. Right? You can do it on a scale of 0 to 1. You can do it from minus 1 to 1. You can do it from 0 to 255. You can do it from minus 255 to 255. Um, your data science team might have used one format, but maybe forgotten to tell you what that format was, or you forgot to check, and suddenly, boom, you put things into this model that's supposed to be this indestructible, amazing thing, and it doesn't work. So, so far from what people are seeing, cases where the model conversion doesn't work and it's not a library versioning issue, this is the problem. So keep that in mind, especially for vision applications as you move in there. A couple of predictions for Core ML, right? Apple is clearly making this a core area of development. If you even just look at the featured videos from WWDC 2017, at least last time I looked, Core ML was second after the State of the Union. Um, so it's really a big thing. 
As we all know, Apple's also acquiring tons of AI startups, right? They've been at that for the last few years. So there's every reason to think they're going to grow this very quickly. As far as things you want to keep on your radar, things they're likely to do soon, one is fine tuning. That's when you can do a little bit of training, right? That's when you take a neural network, you pop off the very end of the neural network, and that's the bit you train. So you might have a 40-layer deep neural network. You might just train the last bit. And the reason you do that, and almost everyone does that in the neural network space, is things like image recognition. You probably have a particular kind of image, right? Maybe your app takes pictures of what people ate and tells them what they ate or counts carbs or something like that. Or maybe your app takes pictures of people and tells you who of them might be criminals or something like that, right? So you have a very specific application. You can train a general model to that specific application. It is computationally demanding, but not nearly as much as building a full model. So my guess is that's something that's going to come down the pipeline soon. Another thing that jumped out at me as missing that I hope is missing for Apple they'll be working on is R support. So other than Python, the other big data science language is R. It's been around for a really long time. It tends to be the choice of languages for academics, people in finance, people in biostats, people in politics. Um, so there are sort of certain obvious packages that you probably want to convert. I haven't seen anybody yet post anything on GitHub as far as doing their own converter, but I think this is something Apple will probably have in mind for next year. And another big thing that's missing is unsupervised learning. So every kind of machine learning that Apple is letting you implement on device now has to do with making some sort of prediction or classification. I think in the future, they are going to allow ways that you look at the data and you sort of just learn from the data rather than trying to predict things. Um, this is computationally taxing, so it's just as likely as doing some other kinds of on-device learning, but it is a major area they're missing. So it's likely something they're going to address one way or another next year. Um, and one thing to keep in mind is everything is less demanding than training neural networks, right? So neural networks are the most interesting, but you can still make a lot of progress in other sort of less sexy areas because the computation is so much smaller. So those are just some preliminary thoughts on Core ML. I also want to walk you through some machine learning concepts. I'm guessing that most people here have not done a lot in this area. Um, I, I may or may not be right about that. Certainly with my colleagues, most of them haven't looked at this stuff. But it's about to sort of descend on you in your professional life one way or another. Um, so I want you to just feel comfortable with the concepts involved. First scary word that I noticed, for example, in the Apple Docs is something called regularization. And there are a lot of scary words in the Apple Docs, which is why I want to go through this. It's not something I'm trying to force on you, but they are sort of assuming a minimum level of knowledge. And so the faster you can acquire that, the better. So regularization is at the core of most machine learning today. The idea with regularization is on the left, you have training loss, right? You have this sort of objective function, what you want to minimize or maximize to get the best model. Traditionally, you just think about what's called training loss, which is, did I get the right answer or did I not get the right answer? But there isn't just, did I get the right answer or did I not get the right answer? There also is something, is my model too complicated? And that's what the parameter on the right is. And this is something that has become really kind of mandatory in the last 10 years or so. Um, and more and more, the more data we get, the more important it is to avoid overfitting. So on the right, you have something called your regularization parameter, where you basically penalize your model for getting too complicated. So regularization is a way to prevent your model from getting too complicated. That's about as much as you need to know. You also want to just understand the idea of overfitting and underfitting. This is something that will also get tossed around a lot when you start having meetings with data scientists. Um, the illustrations on the top, I think, are pretty obvious examples, right, where even somebody who is just hearing the word overfitting for the first time sort of sees what I mean. So on the upper left-hand corner, we've got a couple of points. And one of your colleagues might come to you with this model in blue, right, and say, I have this amazing model. It fits all of the data perfectly. I have found a way to describe every single one of our users. Um, it would actually be really useful if you have enough knowledge to sort of look at these graphs and say, are you sure? Because sort of before I code this and change the entire interface on my app, I just really want to make sure you thought, you thought this through. Um, and the design you might, you might do if this is sort of the true relationship would be very different than if the true relationship is just this line, right, which is much more likely. So this is a, a great example of overfitting. Here on the right also, right, you could have two different models. One would be this black line. So the black line sort of gets things wrong trying to divide the blue from the red, right? It doesn't get everything right. 
So that might be one model someone gives you versus another one with the green might be 100% right. But it's probably not actually true, right? The reality is, is that reality is messy. And so if your model is perfect, chances are you're overfitting. And if you're presenting graphs like this, chances are you're overfitting. Um, a good metric, if you look sort of at the bottom, like a sort of a rule of thumb, right, is you want your model to look like the data, but not too much like the data. So on the left, we can see we're underfitting. Underfitting is when you're using a model that's too simple. And that's also a bad thing, right? That means you have data that you're not using, but you should be using. So an example here, right, we can sort of see the data does have a curve to it, but we've actually just decided we're going to fit a linear model, right? Um, that's bad, not only because my model's not as good as it can be, but also it's sort of biased, right? You see that over here, I'm systematically, say, making a prediction that's too low, whereas over here, I'm systematically making a prediction that's too high. So underfitting is arguably just as bad as overfitting and something you want to encourage your data scientists to avoid as you sort of manage your data scientists. Um, just right is something that will still have error, but will reflect the overall look and feel of your data, what you know about how it should work. And then here's yet another ridiculous example of overfitting. How do people tend to diagnose this usually? Well, they usually do something like this. They look at their error. That's the blue, right? That's the difference between reality and my prediction, the blue. And that will go down and down and down as you train or as you make a more and more complicated model. But what won't go down is your cross-validation error. That's the, that's the plot in red. So your cross-validation error is when you break your data into different segments. You build models with one segment, and you train on another. And you can do this many times. You can do, say, a 10-way validation, cross-validation, a 20-way, et cetera. If you see that your error goes down, but your cross-validation error goes up after a point, what that means is you're building a model that's really specific to one subsection of your data. And the way you can see that is that if you test out of sample new data, it starts getting wrong and wrong and wrong again. So this is something you will also see as you start working with data science teams. They will have diagnostic plots like these. Other terms you'll encounter that you don't want to scare you, but that you will see, say, in the Apple Docs, pre-processing just means getting your data ready. Cross-validation, I just told you what that is. That's breaking up your data into chunks and building on one chunk, testing on another. And you can do it sort of in a round robin of 5 or 10 or 20. Testing and training sets, right? That's when you just chunk your data in two, one to build your model, another one to validate your model. Wide data versus long data. So wide data is when you know a lot about not too many people or not too many whatever, right? And that's why it's called wide. You can imagine in an Excel spreadsheet, you might have three people, so you have three rows, but maybe you have hundreds of columns of information about them. On the other hand, long data is when you might have many, many rows. Maybe you had many, many participants in whatever experiment you did, but you don't know very much about them. So that's sort of the opposite problem. Normalized data, what that is is when you take a data that might have all sorts of different kooky distributions and you conform them all to have the same distribution. And you do that because you want all attributes to be weighed equally. And then finally, model compression is when you have a perfectly good model, but it's too complicated or too big for other reasons, like you want to move it onto your iOS device. So in that case, what are you going to do? You're going to look for smart ways to make it a little simpler without losing too much accuracy. So now I'm going to go ahead and talk a bit about the models that Apple highlighted as things that they're currently supporting. Linear regression and logistic regression support vector machines, SVM, tree ensembles, and neural networks. First, let's talk about regression models. If we look at linear regression models, what they try to do is they try to predict a dependent value via a linear relationship with a set of predictors, right? This is very common. You see this in the newspaper. Chances that you got out of college without seeing this in one form or another are pretty low. Um, but it's basically, how do I describe any sort of relationship with a straight line? There's also something called logistic regression. You see this on the, on the right-hand side. This is when you are actually trying to predict, say, a category or a probability, right? So if I have all this information about a person, but maybe I don't have their gender, I'm trying to predict male versus female, or I have a lot of data about a user, and I'm trying to predict are they a US customer or a non-US customer? So it can be binary. It can be more than binary. But this is the general idea. These are all under the heading of regression models. So these try to predict a dependent value via a linear relationship with a set of predictors. Your normal methodology makes fairly vanilla assumptions about your input data, such as that each data point is independent of the other data points, that your error is sort of random, things like that, that seem pretty reasonable. 
um, but don't tend to be true in the real world. So assumptions aren't always true. There's usually a workaround. And another thing to know about regression models is that they're computationally cheap relative to other models, right? So if you ever are going to attack a problem, this is probably the first thing you want to do. It's really easy. Um, it remains a workhorse of prediction in very many domains. All of this is also true of logistic regression, which uses linear methods but seeks to model a probability, which is bounded, right? So that's why it's different. You can only go between 0 and 1, whereas a linear regression can go off to infinity, and that's no problem at all. Most real-world models will use some form of regularization, which we talked about already, right? So what's sort of really common nowadays in linear regression is either the lasso or the ridge methodology, which basically penalizes all of your coefficients, right? So if I want to model probable income as a function of zip code and age and education level, I might also say, well, my education level coefficient, it just can't get too big, right? Maybe it's a really good predictor, but I'm going to sort of put a limit on how much I'm going to use it. And that's what regularization is. What are some pros and cons of regression models? Well, the first is that straightforward statistical models like these can give you confidence intervals. Logistic regression also provides probabilities. So in addition to getting a classification, right, like male or female, American or not American, uh, red, white, or blue flower, whatever you're trying to predict, you can get the probability as well. So you don't just get rows. You get 95% confidence that it's a rose, which can be very helpful. Some have closed form solutions. What does that mean? That means for those of you who remember your, your linear algebra, you can write a lot of these models simply as a matrix multiplication or maybe a matrix inversion followed by a matrix multiplication. That is a pain in the butt, but compared to things like neural networks, it's still really straightforward. So these are still very cheap, very, very fast to do on iOS, especially if you're going to use a GPU because those things are amazing at uh, matrix multiplication. So very useful in that sense. There is also well-defined and developed refinements for tricky data problems. So it's just a, an established area, which is always very helpful. What are some cons? Well, firstly, we don't always have a good reason to think linear relationships are linear, right? So I might want to say there's a linear relationship between education and income, but that's not really true, right? It's not as though if you only went to 11th grade versus 12, you make like that 10% more income definitely, right? That's not how it works at all. Um, Things like the assumptions not being true, right? So input data is not always independent, right? So my data points are not always independent, even though I assume they are. This is especially going to be true when we're building machine learning models for our users, right? For example, we'll have a lot of data points about what one user did. Those are not independent data points. Um, they're also very sensitive to outliers, and they only look at the means of a dependent, a dependent variable without looking at the distribution, right? So you're basically getting a super, super simplistic version of the world. What is the next model supported by Apple? Support vector machines. These are very similar to logistic regression. What you're generally trying to do is put something into a category. It can be two-way. It can be more than two-way. But what this does is it actually tries to build a frontier between your groups and whatever geometry you're using. And it doesn't just have to be a straight line. So you can also do things like this, where you transform. You take one feature space where things look kind of funky. But you can find a clever way to divide them such that you are effectively using a hyperplane. So this is very, very cool as far as not overfitting, right? This is not cheating. It's just finding a way to transform your data and then use a very simple model. So the support vector machine is a separating plane, which best separates groups. What it does is it maximizes the classification accuracy, right? So first, it makes sure that it gets as many reds on the red side, as many blues on the blue side as possible. And then it maximizes distance from that plane. So it wants to both be correct and also have the plane sort of be in as empty a space as possible. It's possible to have these nonlinear hyperplanes, as I was just showing you. What are some pros? Well, it's memory efficient. Um, it can do really well when you have very high dimensions relative to your number of points. So this could be like if you are doing some sort of model about your users, you know a lot, a lot, a lot about your users, but you don't have so many of them. This is the model that will handle that really well. Um, so it works very well with strong signal. It's robust to outliers. On the other hand, it does not do so well with noisy samples, and it can take a very long time to train. Third kind of uh, model covered by Apple, tree ensembles. So firstly, what's a decision tree? This is something you may have run into, but if you haven't, a decision tree is probably the most sort of intuitive and obvious way that we might think of to build a model, right? Like if you try to hard code some AI into your app, 
you might even just sort of write this as a bunch of control statements, if, else, if, else, right? So if the user says yes to this first question, then go to this branch, right? If the user says no, go to this other branch. And so we can see an example here, maybe trying to predict, does somebody like computer games? And so you might say something like, well, are they above or below the age of 15? And are they male? And something like that might lead you to one answer versus another for a given person. Now, what are ensembles of trees? Well, one example is random forest. There's actually a bunch of different ways to build ensembles of trees. The idea here is, well, no model is, no model is that great, especially tree models. They're really not that great. But what turns out um, to be really interesting is that you can take, like, say, 100 dumb models, put them together, and they actually become incredibly intelligent. And this is sort of something that came even before people talked about crowdsourcing, right? Like, if you ask enough people what the right answer is, even if those people are not so smart, they'll generally sort of come to a consensus of the right answer. It's the same thing with the models. The models don't know very much about what they're trying to learn, but if you ask them all and they all sort of agree, or most of them sort of agree, you get the right answer regardless. So these are also fairly computationally simple, except that you have to have so many of them, and that's where the, the downside computationally is here. Um, what are some pros? Random ensembles are very robust, especially to really problematic kinds of data where things are sort of very related to each other. They have a high accuracy with an uncomplicated methodology, right? So I was able to explain what they are and hopefully make sense to you all in like five or 10 seconds, right? This is like a way we even work in the real world. We use these sort of decision trees. So they're very intuitive. We can understand why they do what they do. The cons is that they're not really easy to visually interpret, right? So with, say, a, a regression model or an SVM, you can plot what you just did, right? And you can color things in and sort of look at your model. When you have an ensemble of 100 trees or 1,000 trees, each of which has its own logic, I mean, imagine looking at not two of these, but 1,000 of these, you can't really audit, right? You can't sort of look at it and get a gut feeling, is this good or not? So that's one of the cons. OK, and then finally, the big beast in the room, neural networks. I'm guessing most people have encountered these at some form because they are just such a hot topic. They have really exploded since 2012 when like, all of a sudden, boom, the world realized we have enough computing power to do really awesome things with these. Um, and so the way they work, as you can see here, is you'll have one input layer. You can have as many or as few inputs as you want. So you could, if you wanted, have just one input. Right? We tend to describe them with many because the most sort of impressive uses of neural networks to date have been for images. And for images, you're going to have a lot of inputs. Right, Each pixel is going to be one of your inputs. But you can have as many as few of, or as few as you want. Then you have a bunch of hidden layers, right? which are layers like these that are just wired together. They get one input. They sort of chug along, decide what they're going to do, and they put out another input. How they decide to do that is mostly a function of what's called an activation function. I won't go into that. You've probably heard a little bit about it. But there's different ways of sort of saying, I got this data. What am I going to do with it? They're sort of inspired by biology, but actually a lot of the advances have come from departing from biology and realizing that what we think works in biology is not very computationally uh, cheap. So they have actually sort of moved to cheaper ways of computing these things, and they do really well. To give you an idea, sort of state of the art for neural network, right? Like here we're picturing two layers, but state of the art neural networks, it could be 40 layers, it could be 400 layers, it kind of depends where you're trying to run it. And sort of, it's sort of the more layers, the better, right? It never gets better per se just by cutting layers. So it's almost like the more you can afford, the better. And there's a lot less risk of overfitting than there is in these other models. So just to give you an idea, um, convolutional neural networks are the ones most common with images we can see here. What they do is they take a bunch of pixels, and you can do all sorts of interesting matrix operations. They all amount to different ways of taking some region and combining it into one number. Right? So in this kernel, for example, I'm just sort of taking the diagonals, as you can see in this blue box, 1, 1, 1, and the others are zeros. It's almost like I'm sort of ignoring some. And you can do all sorts of things. Right? So in the past, these were used even before neural networks to do things like blurring. So you can see an example of that here with the crab. How do you blur an image with a Gaussian filter? It's just one way of doing a convolution. How do you say sort of add contrast? Well, I would just sort of change the numbers here. I would add some negative numbers and some positive numbers, and that'll give me some kind of filter that selects for contrast. Um, convolutional neural networks get really complicated, and they start selecting for really interesting shapes, like squares or a right-hand corner or a circle. That is part of why they're so deep, is they get really specific as to what they are selecting for. 
I'm going to skip over a few of these and just show you sort of state of the art ish. Inception is one example of one of these amazing neural networks where you can give it a few million images and it hardly ever makes a mistake. It will tell you, that's a bird, that's a smart water. Like, this is a woman on a stage. I mean, it gets really, really smart. How does it do, though, and why do people keep talking about why these are so computationally taxing? Well, here's a diagram, a layout of what you're doing here. So each of these little boxes is just one layer of your neural network, right? So you can see there's, I don't know, 50, 80-ish, and they're all doing different sort of things, right? So some of them are doing that convolution that I discussed, and some of them are doing other sorts of um, operations to either reduce operation or, summar or reduce information or summarize information or sort of randomly get rid of data to avoid overfitting. So this is, a, this is gonna be a big challenge to move this fully onto iOS. People are attempting to do this, but this is definitely gonna lag behind the other machine learning elements, right? So the other models we just covered are things that can be described in one, two, maybe a few hundred parameters. Something like Inception, we're looking at like a few hundred thousand parameters. So that's still many orders of magnitude different, and that's something to keep in mind when setting expectations. So this will give you the best performance, but it is so much more expensive. Okay, so thank you for bearing with me. I have a few final things I wanna just call your attention to. Um, I just really feel this is a big moment in terms of iOS engineers moving into this area that's exploding. Um, I also think that it's exploding in part because of mobile, right? So our apps are both what is going to use the AI, but we are also sort of what is producing the data and producing the demand for the AI. So I think we are really at a very important space as far as relating to the public, facing the public, and thinking about how we're gonna treat them. So that is something to keep in mind. Um, and I just wanna talk a bit about that. So Core ML, right? A few things Apple talked about. Apple listed the benefits as user privacy, right? You do your modeling, or you, you do your modeling separately, and then you provide the info on the device. So they said, oh, well, you save data costs and you save server costs because you don't start sending all these things back and forth. And I think especially for something like an image, that's certainly a compelling argument, right? That you're not uploading an image and then maybe downloading another image that sort of has your machine learning output, fine. Um, but there are, there are downsides. So as much as I love Core ML, there are some things to think about, right? So you've got your, your larger footprint on the device. It can actually be much, much larger, right? Because some of these models are enormous. So that's something to think about. Um, another thing is you can correct models on the server side, and you can correct them while you sort of watch what they're doing. You can also, as I talked about, correct your models on the device, because Apple is giving you the ability to download models and compile them on the fly but you can't sort of correct it as you watch how the model's behaving, right? So one way data scientists will refine their models and make them better is precisely to look at input, figure out was it right or not based on what comes out, and actually sort of know what the new uses are versus what they trained. You can't really do that if you're gonna follow the classic um, core ML paradigm, right? You're gonna sort of put your model out there and maybe not know that much about what's going on. Um, Server-side also keeps the model builders closer to the production version, right? Whereas now we're gonna be putting another core. And so that also worries me a little bit in terms of is it gonna be as good as it can? Is it gonna be as performant and as accurate as it can be? Um, apart from image-related applications, many models run on small input data. So apart from the privacy concern, there's actually a lot of reasons to argue that it's a really good idea to send it over to your server where people can keep an eye on it and refine on the go, and people aren't really paying a huge data cost. Um, there's more downsides, though. For some organizations, your model is your core IP. It could even be the whole value of your company is what is in that model that you're running. Um, so you probably don't want to put that in some sort of open source file format and just sort of leave it on a device where clever people can certainly find it. Um, model performance and correctness checking may get forgotten. Now, why is that so important? You might say, well, the market will regulate that, right? Because if my app's algorithm isn't that great, people won't use my app, so I have every reason to care. Um, but actually, there's this whole area that people are beginning to realize is also a problem, which is the ethics, right? So ethics in AI and machine learning is an increasingly fraught area. It's increasingly an area people are worried about. In particular, there's the possibility that there is unintentional, say, racial and gender discrimination in a lot of the AI that is already out there. Um, and if it's not something people keep an eye on, it's only gonna get worse. 
One example, right, because we all think, well, I'm a good person. I don't want to do any of these things. And the people who have done them so far haven't meant to do them, but it's incredibly easy to do. And so that's something you also want to keep your eye out for. One thing um, to keep in mind, for example, is it's usually done by proxy, right? So something like zip code is actually a really strong proxy for race, right? So you might think, well, I didn't build a racially discriminatory algorithm, but actually if you ask people for their zip code, chances are you effectively did build a racially discriminatory algorithm. So I think that's really important to be aware of, even if you are only implementing someone else's models. If you catch something like that, it's very valuable for you to be able to say, well, have you thought about the implication of using this? And like, are you sure it's really ethical? So that's something to keep in mind. For this reason, and because there have already been so many troubling examples of this, um, this is becoming an increasingly regulated area. So the FTC, for example, is getting involved, especially with websites. They're more likely now to start looking at apps, looking at ways that people of different color or different gender are treated differently by sort of seemingly innocuous apps. You have the obligation to make sure you are putting out correct models, even if you didn't build them. So I would just encourage you to keep that in mind and to remember for that reason that as much as Apple is a fan of privacy, that you have some tension between privacy and fairness, right? You can only determine that your model is fair if you are watching how it performs, which is, in a way, in tension with the whole idea of just sort of putting it out in the wild and giving people their privacy. Um, so I'm going to cut myself short. I just want to leave you guys with one final idea in AI, which is that the hard things are easy and the easy things are hard. Um, so what's been done already and the models that you're sort of going to be putting onto your device do really hard things, right? Like identify flowers or like tell you exactly what, what species, like this particular zebra, which zebra species is it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the hard things are actually still going to be in the implementation, right? When you put them on the device, it's not going to be exactly the environment that your data science team envisions. So the more that you can contribute and understand this area, I think the more you're going to help them with sort of the easy things on the device. Um, so thank you for giving me your time and listening to this talk, and good luck getting started with CoreML.